Hello everyone and welcome to Bourbon Bites Whiskey Reviews with a Gaming Twist. I'm your host Clifton and welcome to another Thursday night live stream. We have such a fun show tonight. We're bringing on a very, very special guest here shortly from Forgate. Um, but I want to say thank you to everyone that's uh, tuned in tonight. I know a lot of people are going live tonight. I was looking, I was like, oh my gosh, Jason's live, Perry's live as normal, the like time folks are live. So I appreciate you tuning in live or watching the replay. If you're watching the replay, hello, leave me a comment down below after the stream and let me know what you thought of tonight's show. Um, but if you're here in the chat, welcome. I see a few people have been pre-gaming here. I see Donnie, the Linux cat, who is our amazing mod here tonight. Donnie says, y'all ready for this? I'm ready for this. So um, some of y'all know, I told y'all on Discord, but we had our work Christmas party, literally, like I literally walked in the door five minutes ago from that party. So Cliffy, who is my drunk name, may appear towards the end of the stream. Maybe we'll see. We'll keep it professional for the first part. Um, but Donnie, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Sugar Kitty is here. What's up, Sugar Kitty? Good to see you. Sugar Kitty is a patron and Bite Club member of the show. Um, hopefully you're having a great night, Sugar Kitty. I saw you on someone else's stream earlier tonight. Perry from This Is My Bourbon Podcast. What's up, Perry? So good to see you. I'm sorry I missed your stream. I know you had a few guests on as well. Um, I will I will be catching up on everyone's stream right, <laughs> right after the show tonight. Um, Todd Ritter is also here. I get to listen to Straub talk all the time. You'd think I learn. Well, <laughs> Todd, yes, we, we, we have some very great info coming later tonight um, from Forgate, especially about this release that we're reviewing here tonight. Uh, who else do I see? I think, you know, Zofer said made it good, good timing Zofer. Cause I, I barely made it myself. Um, Brandon says, let's do this. Good to see you, Brandon. Oh, mash and drum. What is up, Jason? I know you were live. Y'all did a barrel pick earlier. I hope it went well. I'm sure it did. Y'all had Dave and Kira, Kira on. So sure. It was a great time. <laughs> um, uh, Adam free. What's up, Adam? Good to see you, man. Great talking to you the other night. Uh, cool. Bourbon baller. Good to see you. So, yes, as y'all know from the title of this video, we have a very special guest from Four Gate Whiskey Company on. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and introduce him. Why not? Please welcome Bill from Four Gate. Bill, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on, man. Like I, <laughs> I'm sorry it was like super rushed. As soon as you popped on, I'm like, let's go live. Let's do it. <laughs> no, that's my fault. I was a little late. No, I was too. So I, I was I was literally panicking, like pulling my green screen together. We're, but we made it. We made it. We're here on time. <laughs> nice. Um, well, it's so great to finally get a chance to chat with you. I know we met like was it? Over, it was over a year ago when we first met. I think. I think so. Yeah, it's been a while. And it, it was virtual because it was on Repeal Day Expo from Fred Minnick. Um, not mm -hmm. this not this year, but the previous year. Um, that yes, was my introduction yes. to Forgate. I'm like. I've never heard of this brand, but ever since then, I mean, you guys have been very generous in offering samples. And I honestly found one of my favorite whiskeys from last year, which was the um, uh, the Ruby Rye Springs, I think. Oh, that's a great one. I love that. That was actually. on my list of top bourbons of 2020. So we, we have a, three new whiskeys here that you guys just put out. It's called the uh, Bluegrass Collect or Br Bluegrass Trilogy. Um, yep. But before we get into that and go into details, you know, some people here may be new to Forgate. Please tell us a little bit about, you know, not just the company, but yourself as well. You've been, I mean, you kind of have been in the whiskey review world before Forgate, right? Yeah, I um, I started with a with a friend of mine. I started at ModernThirst.com back mm -hmm. in uh, 2014 or 15 or whenever that was. So we were kind of, kind of um, I guess the bourbon boom had already started, but um, uh, it was still really kind of picking up steam, I guess, at the time. And we were just very lucky. We got we were pretty successful with that, and it, it kind of led its way into um, um, it's first started with barrel picks when private picks first came out. No one knew how to do them, so mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of local stores around here, and even people even people far out of town were, were paying me to to help them do a barrel uh, a barrel pick, mm. um, and that led into doing some um, uh, some consulting with some of the major brands and helping them launch some labels. And I just uh, eventually kind of got tired of everyone. Um, ignoring everything I said. <laughs> and uh, I had met uh, my partner with Forgate, Bob D'Antoni, and met him through a mutual friend of ours. And and he knew Kelvin Cooperage very well. I went and met Kelvin Cooperage. And the idea kind of percolated in my head for a while that if, if you were doing things on a very small scale, and you got to walk through this Kelvin Cooperage, um, they have barrels from all over the world, you know, mm -hmm. sherry barrels and rum barrels and wine barrels, and you name it, they've got they've got them in there at different times. Sometimes they're only going to have a handful of them. Sometimes they'll have 100 um, so, you know, the, the, the big companies wouldn't care about 12 barrels sitting in there that are fantastic. But if you're small enough, it could be, a, a you know, a really you can do really fun things with it. So I called Bob up about a year later and asked him if he wanted to start a company 
And I don't think I'd gotten the, uh, the sentence completely out of my mouth. And he, he was quitting his, his day job and, uh, <laughs> um, we were, we were running a bourbon company. So, wow, that's a big risk. I know that that's like one of the scare. I've never done it myself, but I've heard from a lot of guests. Like that's both extremely exciting, but also extremely scary. Cause it's, it's a crazy industry to be in. I've heard. It's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. I, I, I've, I've been amazed at how friendly the industry is, uh, mm-hmm. within the industry. I mean, every, I, I think everyone kind of, kind of goes by the rising tide motto in the bourbon industry. If, if, if I'm out there doing something successful, it's only going to help, you know, old Carter, um, sell more bottles. If they're doing something real well, it's only going to, going to help barrel bourbon, uh, you know, so it, it's mm-hmm. been very interesting to me how, how close knit the, the industry is and, and how friendly everyone is really. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. That's great. I, especially for you guys being relatively new. I mean, did Forgate, what was the year that you guys started with this? Cause it's been pretty recent, right? We started the company about three and a half years ago, but our first mm-hmm. batch came out in April of 2019. Gotcha. So it took us, so, it took us a little while to get everything rolling once we had started the company and, you know, source the whiskey and blend it and age it and, I mean, that's incredible from, for such a young company, for you guys getting access to some of what people say is like the best whiskeys that's being put out right now. Um, I am, yeah. I, I, like I said, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I was a huge, huge fan of the, um, the port, the port rye that you guys released. I think it was last year. Yep. Um, it was last fall. Yeah. That was yeah. my, probably my favorite batch until, until batch 17 that just came out, which I think may have taken over for me, but oh, we wow. were really happy with that, that Ruby port finish on that rye because Mm -hmm. that was the first one we went into when i i was looking for a specific flavor of whiskey we knew we had the the ruby port rum barrels um and bobby and i were talking about what we wanted to do with it and i knew i knew what i want i knew i wanted to do a rye i wanted to be around seven or eight years old and i knew what i wanted one of the final flavor profile to be and i just love how it turned out tons of tart cherries on that that just i love it it just was literally i i ever since trying that bottle i've been seeking out other ryes that have been finished and really crazy casks because like the the impact of those casks had on that rye whiskey was some of the best i've ever tried so it's got me super excited for finishing which is kind of the point of what we're talking here about here today now i have not had any of the bourbons released from Fourgate until today so i'm so excited to try this uh bluegrass trilogy with you can you tell us a little bit about you know how this batch 15 came to be and why there's like three different ones versus just one batch yeah it's actually it's kind of a trilogy two different ways um we had uh we had talked about blending three different distillates together um, and calling it the Kentucky trilogy uh, before we knew how we were going to finish it. Okay. And we'd had all these amazing dark rum casks from the, from the Florida Keys. And we, we, so we blended this whiskey, we put it in the dark rum casks. And when I tasted it, I thought it was fine, but I didn't, I didn't think it was great. And mm-hmm. it, we weren't really pushing any boundaries with it or doing anything crazy. So I was kind of hesitant to just bottle it up and use it as is. Uh, meanwhile, so we, we had tanked that. Uh, they were in, in some big holding tanks where we were going to decide what to do with it. Meanwhile, uh, I met Bobby over at Kelvin Cooperage, and they had just brought in the shipment of these Tawny Port and a pair of Shara barrels. And we snapped up as many as we could, even though we didn't have any whiskey for it yet. We didn't know what we were going to do. You can't have those barrels just sit around. And Bobby, right? you know, I think I was having a conversation with William Hornaday of Kelvin Cooperage, and Bobby interrupted me and said, what about that rum? And I said, oh, that's a fantastic idea. And then as we were doing that, we started thinking, how can we play around with this trilogy name a little more? Well, what if we half of it goes in the port barrels, half in the in the sherry, and then we take a portion of each of those and then blend them back together so you have a, yet a third presentation of the same underlying whiskey. So there's nice. essentially three finishes. Technically, I guess you could say there's four finishes because of the rum is in there as well, um, but three different distillates all from Kentucky as well. Gotcha. So, so like you said, it was a bit of a trilogy before it even got finished. So you're blending three different bourbons. I know you, you gave me the info here. Um, so for those of you that are watching, um, this is a blend of a six year. It's all Kentucky bourbon. Um, yep. There's a six year with a mash bill of 78% corn, 10% rye and 12% malted barley. A nine year um, with a mash bill of 75% corn, 13% rye and 12% malted barley. And a 12 year Kentucky bourbon, um, 74% corn, 18% rye and 8% malted barley. Um, so Bill, I didn't get a chance to chat with you a bit before this, but these guys in the chat are super nerdy. So they love these details. I know it seems like crazy to be sharing, which by the way, I did, I forgot to mention, can you see the comments over on the side bill? Um, yes. okay, cool. I, I always forget to tell people to turn that on. Don't worry about keeping up with it. I'll, I will highlight messages, but I just, cause I, I feel bad cause I've had certain people do a whole stream and like, they don't realize there's comments over them. Like, ah, oh, I wish I would have told you. So I, I forgot to tell you, but we're good. <laughs> no, no worries. 
So, um, by the way, just a couple more shout outs to people coming in. Storytime Whiskey, what's up? Good to see you guys. Glad, glad you're here. Um, who you call a nerd? Nerd, I know, right? <laughs> I, we're all we're all nerds. I knew y'all would appreciate the Mashville, so I had to get that out there. Um, I see Bill in here. Bill was on a uh, another stream um, with Perry earlier, so good to see you. Zofer says double thumbs up. Yes, make sure to leave a thumbs up while y'all are here tonight. It does help out the channel. Um, Steven says, hey, people, would love to see Forgate get distributed further. But the samples I've had have been really good. So Steven is up in New York State. Um, so I know they're on Seal. You guys are with Sealbox, right? So they just they we are Sealbox and BourbonOutfitter.com uh, mm -hmm. and Caskers.com. So there's three online retailers, and then we're in um, six states now. So we're in Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. We just just got into Texas. Um, we awesome. are planning to expand um, one to three states per year depending on, on whether or not our production can keep up with it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Trevor says, I just got Trilogy two weeks ago and love it. Yes, I'm so excited to get into this because I, I remember you guys talked to, you guys announced it, I guess, a while back ago, right? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until recently that we're starting to actually see it show up in places. Yeah, we um, we did a, a small number of, we did some collector's boxes uh, from mm -hmm. box sets for the three of them. And we've only been able to get the boxes out in Kentucky so far. They're all being made by hand by a gentleman out in Washington. So oh, it, nice. it takes forever. So they're coming out <laughs> one state at a time. Georgia and in and, and uh, Tennessee will get theirs um, as soon as they're. And I think Tennessee's are about. They're very close. So look at those soon. I actually have the box back here somewhere. Oh yeah, I, I had it in a thumbnail, but I'd love to see it in real life. Wow, that is awesome. But let me let me show. So hold on, let me change the ink. There we go. I think see a little bit more there. Yeah, there it is. Anyway, so yeah, that's like a hand, handmade box. It is. It is. So that's that's awesome. So we talked a little bit about what these are. So you guys, um, the vision was, you know, the rum cask was kind of the core behind it. Is that correct? And then you guys kind of said, like, let's do something more with it. Yeah, we we initially were just going to do the rum because we love the rum cask. But but once we tasted it, we thought it was it was OK. It was fine. I just it's not it wasn't up to what we really want to do. It, it mm -hmm. didn't blow my mind. It didn't push any boundaries. I, you know, I've had rum finished bourbon before. Right. Um, so we just wanted to we just wanted it to be a little more a little different, a little more special than it was. So we were still kind of kicking it back and forth of what exactly we we're going to do with that whiskey. Um, and then these barrels happened to show up at the perfect time. And, and there we had it. And it it, it wound up being a really great uh, combination. And that's awesome. I'm so excited to get something in my glass because, I, like I said, work Christmas party. All I had I had like a beer and a wine. I'm like, <laughs> I, need, I need some bourbon. So. So excited to dive into this. So I'm going to go ahead and pour my Trilogy 1, okay. um, which is 15.1 in terms of the batch, um, which is a Kentucky Straight Bourbon finished in tawny port and dark rum casks, 124.6 um, mm -hmm. proof. So this is, so the the finishes that we're seeing tonight are the tawny port, the, is it a para? A, apera, a para, yeah. A para sherry. And then the final one is a blend of both, correct? Right. All of all of which also have that dark rum finish as well. Gotcha. So I, I'm super. I've become really um, recently. I've discovered the power of finishing. I think a lot of times I was kind of hesitant to really get into a lot of finished whiskeys, um, but over the past year I've been trying so many incredible. Um, mostly it's been rye, so I haven't had too many finished bourbons. A lot of times I've been having a lot of finished ryes, mm -hmm. and the, the impact they have on flavor has been incredible. So I'm so excited to, you know, take these bourbons that that have been finished and cast. Like I said, I'm familiar with like a port finish with a rye, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't had much port finished bourbon. So I'm so excited to see how this expresses itself. Well, these um, these barrels came from Australia, uh, the Tawny Port and the Apera Sherry, um, and they were fresh and in great condition when they got here. I love what it did to the whiskey. And speaking about finished whiskey, you know, that's kind of our, our thing. And we do that intentionally just, just to set ourselves apart. Mm -hmm. I always said that, uh, you know, I'm not going to try to put out a bottle to compete with um, Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill. They can do it at a lot less cost than I can. And I can just go buy their whiskey instead. There's no reason to do that. Um, but I had, I had uh, I'd been introduced to, to uh, a friend of mine, Wes Jolly, uh, out in Colorado, who got me into scotch and other world whiskey. And they use all sorts of barrels. And it amazed me how you could take one mash bill, which is essentially just malted barley, but the flavor profile is across the board. And then you think about bourbon, we can use anything we want as long as it's 51% corn and our flavor profile, because it's always a new barrel is about like that. Right. Um, so I, I was really kind of trying to bring some of that variety you get in world whiskeys into the, into American whiskeys, just kind of show people that it's not a gimmick. We don't use, we don't use cheap stuff. We don't use our young, we don't use young stuff. 
If we wouldn't drink the blend before we finish it, we won't finish it. Um, so our stuff is, is high quality. We use only the best whiskey we can, we can find. Um, and then we try to accentuate it a little bit. We're not trying to cover up flaws or anything along those lines. So was that kind of what got you really into passion about starting the, the four gate? Like, was it the finishing or was it more of the, like the sourcing? Cause I know you said you, you kind of did a bit of that before you launched the company, like, you know, no, it was definitely the finishing. I, I really okay. wanted, I, I was amazed by what was in the warehouse at Kelvin Cooper here in Louisville, mm -hmm. the different barrels. And I, I just started thinking that, you know, if, if you were small enough and nimble enough to, if you cared about batches of two or 3000 bottles, um, you could have a field day there. <clears throat> and I, I just want to do something a little different. You know, not many people are, are really um, not many people are really um, trying to put out high quality finished stuff. It's usually their youngest. Yeah, because a lot of times people, you know, cover up youth for, you know, like, oh, this is a young whiskey. Let's just slap it in a port barrel and release it. So I totally understand what you're saying with that. Um, I'm so excited to try it. I mean, like I said, was so impressed with the the finished, the port finished rye. I'm so excited to try it in a bourbon from you guys. Um, so while I, I have this in my glass, I'm going to nose it for a bit. But I question from our friend Perry at This Is My Bourbon Podcast. He said, Bill, what's up with all the music equipment behind you? Do you have a secret passion that we're not privy to? Yes, I, I am an well. incredibly mediocre guitar player. Okay. Perry, Perry's a musician and guitarist as well. So I have no musical abilities whatsoever, but <laughs> that's awesome. So so do you do that just as a hobby? Do you do it like some like professionally a bit as well or? No, I, I did a little, some friends of mine and I did a, a band when I was right out of college. So 20 years ago or so, uh, we just played a few business Christmas parties, things like that. Uh, but it's just I a hobby. Wish there was a band at my Christmas party. <laughs> um, question from Todd Ritter. He says, did all three trilogies go into the finishing barrels at the same proof? I know there's slight variation in the bottled proofs. Good question. Yes, they did because they were all tanked. They they had been um, the whiskey was blended a, as a batch, and then it was put into the rum barrels, and then all of those were put into a tank, a, a giant holding tank, mm -hmm. or two holding tanks probably. Um, so they were all the same proof, and then we we filled the 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 final finishing barrels from that. Gotcha. And do you guys, I guess it's not on the press release. About how long, on average, were each of these finished? Were they different per um, part of the trilogy, or was it kind of about the same? No, I think these were. Um, I believe this one was around 35 days. Um, again, we okay. we always want to be able to taste the underlying whiskey. We don't want to cut. We don't want to. We don't want to kill it. Um, but mm -hmm. we've very seldom have we gone over 60 days on a, on a barrel finish. Gotcha. Well, especially with those, like I mean, I assume I mean just on the nose of this alone, I can tell there's a they lot of fresh. that. that were, I was going to say that's a very wet barrel. I guess like you can get a lot of that. Oh, if, no, if you, yet, but if you reuse finished barrels, which we yeah. haven't done very often, if, if we only have a handful, we might we might fill them twice. But you yeah. have to age them longer the second time. Each, each time you use it, you have to age it a little bit longer. Gotcha. So this is so for those that are just now tuning in. This is trilogy one. This is the one that was finished in tawny port barrels. So I'm going to go ahead and go into it. Cheers, Bill, and thank you again I've for joining it. us here. Absolutely. I only have uh, number three in front of me right now, so. Oh, I'll join you when you get to the third one. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man. You know, I, I noticed so much of the impact of the, the cask on the nose. I wasn't expecting it to be so much on the palate as well. That is desserty. It's like a, a baked pie, like a berry pie kind of note. And that proof is just, that, that's, I, I'm a, a bit of a, a, a proof hound, I guess I would call myself. Um, so I love when things are released at cast strength and especially finish things at cast strength because it, I feel like if you proof it down, you know, you lose a little bit of that impact from the the cask. Have you noticed that as yeah. well? Like, I mean, have you experimented with like lower proofs or are you guys committed, you know, hundred percent cast? Yeah, we're always barrel proof. We're, you know, Bobby and I are both um, in whiskey enthusiasts first. And if I'm going to, if we had water, the price could come down a little bit, but it, you know, if I'm going to, buy anything over a hundred dollars I, I typically would like it to be uh, barrel proof um i can add water that. to it if it's 100 percent agree <laughs> if it's if it's if, if it's if it's too hot i can add water to it and if it's not then um uh you can't ever take the water back out so absolutely yeah no this is i'm gonna have to go in for another sip um so we have some questions oh um, you, got, you guys are have a lot of questions today but i love it i love it <laughs> um our friend marty over at whiskey nose says what is harder for you to choose bill a rye or a bourbon um when term in terms of like the different batches um 
if well, if I'm just drinking it, I tend to I tend to go to the bourbons. Uh, mm. But if I'm, I don't really have a problem choosing anything. Um, we've been very lucky that all of the ryes that we've used have been Indiana ryes, ninety five five, and they've all been between seven and nine years old that we've used. Wow. Um, so they're always good. So we know what we're getting every time. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that rye. Uh, we mm-hmm. do have some interesting stuff come out a little bit later this year. That's a little bit different. Um, uh, probably next year, excuse me, later this year, there isn't much left. Of this year. <laughs> yeah. Next week. <laughs> um, but we'll have some stuff over 2022 and 2023 that are going to be pretty interesting on the rye side. But we kind of like we, we the one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to put out a string of like 10 straight bourbons or 10 straight ryes. Mm-hmm. We just kind of want to have some variety in there. Yeah, I mean, so it's been a minute since I've tried the uh, the rye that I was talking about earlier. I actually, I bought a backup bottle because our friend Fred, who I don't see him here in the chat today, but he saw it in a liquor store and he was in Texas. I'm like, Fred, you will buy me that bottle <laughs> of the rye and I will I will absolutely take that one. So um, yeah, but I mean, I think to me, this that that port is so like jammy, I guess is the way to put it. It's it's mm-hmm. super sweet. It's not, as, not necessarily like a raisin kind of note. It's like fresh fruit jam. Um, that uh, dark rum adds a lot of that. It adds a molasses character to it as well, so it really kind of sweetens it up. Yeah. So, what do you look for with the finish? Like, do you look for more of those, like you know, red berry fruits, or do you look more for, like you said, the the rum cast? Just you personally. Uh, it just depends on it depends on what we're kind of going for. Uh, what whether or not the blend. If the blend is really sweet starting out, then we may not want to pair it with something uber sweet mm-hmm. uh, as a finish. If it comes out very spicy, then I like I like a lot of the you know the fortified wines and the the dark rum it just has happened for us that we've had a lot of dual use barrels that that we get as finished barrels so they originally held sherry and then someone did a batch of rum in them for example so it's sherry rum in one barrel um and we just in fact our very first batch was like that and and we just like that combination so much they just work together well but we've done we've done a few that aren't dual that don't have have anything other than you know we've, we just had rye down under which is just a pair of cherry finished rye mm-hmm. um that one just came out and then we do our split stave every year which is mm-hmm. uh, not really a finished barrel at all so much as it is just a, a second barrel that alternates between toasted and charred staves so yeah i mean you guys are really um, you mentioned earlier that, that kelvin cooperage like you guys are very proud of the barrels that you guys are using for this and i think that's great i love seeing like i've never toured a cooperage but i've heard like next time i go to kentucky i must absolutely visit one because i've heard just the work they do there you don't think about it a lot as a whiskey drinker but the work that goes into those barrels is just amazing so i i assume you've probably you know been involved with those folks and like you know seen it being done i mean what oh, yeah. what fascinates you about especially them that you know the kelvin cooperage well i've been to a couple of the big ones and they're you know it's 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 kind of like a factory you know they they put them on a conveyor belt they go into a room and natural gas fires shoot up for 30 seconds or less and then they move you know they move on into the next room uh, Kelvin is a, it, it's very hands-on. Um, when they, when they fire their barrels, they roll them into the center of this room that has a giant, uh, exhaust hood on top of it. And they ha- literally take the shavings or where they've trimmed the ends of their barrel staves to make them the correct length. They turn them into charcoal so that they light them on fire and they use those, they shovel them by hand into the barrels and it, you know, could take two, three minutes, however long it is that they, they let, let the fire burn inside the barrel from the, um, from their own wood shavings. So, it's just really neat um, seeing the process that goes into it from start to finish about, you know, there's no glue in these things. And these things can last for years and years and years without with very few leaks. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's just amazing watching these people. They're all very skilled. Uh, they're very proud of what they do. And they and to be totally honest, I really think that that their barrels are better. And there, there I, are you're some not the first person that, that's told me that I, I've heard that from a few different brands like, hey, they make some of the best barrels that are out there. They they have some some differences in how they do it. I won't spill any of their secrets or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's certain things that they look for in terms of humidity and and things in the wood that that they do a little different than other people. And I just think that it I, I can tell a difference. A lot of the newer companies that have come out in Louisville, is particularly the ones in Louisville over the last few years, they've put out a lot younger whiskey than I would have bought at the time. But it tasted really good, mm-hmm. even at two or three years old. And mm-hmm. you have to attribute that to the barrel. I mean. Mm-hmm. It's 90% of your flavor. So or 80% of your flavor. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot. And, you know, not being in the industry, it's hard for us to kind of understand that, but having so many folks that are in the industry say the same thing, it definitely tells you, you know, you, you can't just get barrels from anywhere. You got to make sure you trust the sources and they're putting out good stuff. And it sounds like you guys have made a great partnership there with them on that. 
We love it. We really do. And those guys, they, you know, the, the men and women over at Kelvin have been doing this for so, for so long that no one knows more what a particular barrel is going to do to a spirit than they do because they've tasted the before and after on every client they've ever had. Mm -hmm. And when you work with them and you say, I've got this really spicy blend, what should we do with it? They, they're, they're as much of a, a partner for us at, uh, in terms of, of creativity and they aren't just getting us barrels. You know, we, we, we taste with them. We, we have strategic discussions about what, what should we do with this whiskey? How should we finish it? What kind of barrels do you have? What can you get? Can mm -hmm. you, you know, we'll come to them with ideas and say, Hey, we want something like this. Can you help us get them? And, um, you know, they'll, they'll scour the world and bring them in. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Wesley, who is a patron of the show, he says, uh, just got my trilogy and ride down under yesterday. Love all of them. Well, that's, awesome. that's great to hear, Wesley. Glad you enjoy. And then Lil says she has a sample of the seal box pick, um, 114.5 proof. Yeah, so you guys have been doing a few picks. I've noticed um, our friends over Chad and Sarah with its bourbonite did a four gate pick. Um, I believe Mash and Journey did a four gate pick. They did, yeah. They did. So I have not tried that. Uh, I've heard great yeah, things. Yeah, Mash and Journey, yeah. My bourbon journey and, and yep. Mash and Drum, yeah which they they actually they were just live earlier tonight doing another barrel pick for another brand they they're killing it with the picks man i mean definitely you guys if you haven't checked out jason or um scott go check out their their picks and their streams they're they're great guys but so when when it comes to doing a pick from four gate that's kind of interesting so because you you kind of got started you know kind of orchestrating picks and stuff how do you get into letting people do picks of your stuff that you're also you know you're sourcing the stuff how does that work? Like, how did you come across, you know, your pick program? We, um, we, uh, basically will make a, we'll decide how many barrels we want to make available. And part of that is a discussion. If we don't want to flood the market with single barrels and have as many of those out as we do our batches. Um, uh, and a lot of it, a lot of it comes from working with our partners in the distribution chain. How many do they want? How many do they think they want to sell? Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll send out samples. Uh, we'll, we'll ask whether they want to try rye or bourbon or both. Um, we'll send out samples. Um, they pick they pick their barrels and then um, we then bring them those barrels. Uh, we will rebarrel them into a toasted barrel from Kelvin Cooper, a brand new toasted barrel. We'll engrave their name and the dates and everything on the on the barrel head. Um, they get to keep the uh, the barrel or or just the barrel head, depending on what they want. Um, but um, but but it's all all toasted finish, so it comes off really really great marshmallow characteristics, kind of toasted mm -hmm. toasted marshmallow, little creme brulee stuff like that. Oof, that's my favorite note. <laughs> you know, when it, whenever I get toasted marshmallow on a bourbon or a rye, I'm just in heaven. So that that sounds right up my alley. Um, I saw Big Vic was asking which one is sherry and rum barrel. So um, technically, these are all sherry and rum barrels. <laughs> so this is for those of you that are just tuning in. This is batch 15 of Four Gate. It's a triple release. Um, so they have 15.1, 15.2, and 15.3. We just tried 15.1, which is the tawny port and the dark rum cask. And I'm about to move over to the 15.2, which is the uh, Apera. I'm so sorry. Apera. Apera. I'm yeah. so, I, I don't know much about, you know, fortified wine. So I, I'm new. I'm learning. So Apera, I think it's a new term. I, from what I understand, um, in Australia, they just wanted, you know, you have Oloroso sherry that comes from Spain um, mm -hmm. and Pedro Jimenez. Uh, so PX sherry. Um, and they just wanted their own designation. So they made it up. But it's their, gotcha. it's their version of Oloroso sherry. Uh, I got you. Well, our Lil over here in the chat, she's actually in Australia. She's Australian. So Lil, you might have to fill us in about that one. That's really cool. I had no idea. So no, here's another, I guess, newbie question, you know, being someone that's not super. In I appreciate rum, but I'm not super into like the different categories of rum. What makes something, you know, you, you list this as dark rum cask. Is that about the age of the rum or what makes it a dark rum that you're using? I have no rum? idea to be totally okay. honest. That's okay. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Do you I guys just know it's sweeter like what? and darker. <laughs> what what part what regions of like kind of rum it's from is it you know like barbados or is it jamaica these or? are uh florida keys okay gotcha yeah I, i'm so new to rum. i know there's some people in the chat that are more into rum than i am but um I, i've had it on a lot of finishes usually it's a rye that i've had with finished with the rum so I, I don't think i've even had any bourbons that are finished in rum casks so I, I like that it brings sweetness to it and it, it brings a different kind of sweetness, not like a corn sweetness that you get from like a you know mm -hmm. younger bourbon. It brings it more of like a well-rounded, like you said, a molasses kind of note. And I'm definitely getting that on this one. I think it's combining really well for the 15.1. Mm -hmm. It's combining really well with the super fruit forward notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. I, I really different... like the dark rum finish. What it really does that I appreciate is that it, it kind of, it, it gives you a very thick viscous uh, mouthfeel and it extends the finish. 
which I really mm-hmm. like. Um, that rum just kind of sticks around and, and brings hints of bourbon with it, obviously. Uh, but a lot of the, you know, people don't don't always get this, but a lot of older bourbon tends to be very tannic. And when you get mm-hmm. 12 year in here, it, it tends to have a short finish, um, mm-hmm. which is why a lot of, you know, a lot of the old school bourbon guys don't like anything over about seven years. You know, the master distillers think, and almost mm-hmm. everywhere says that's your sweet spot. Um, I I think some of it can clearly go past seven years, but uh, <laughs> but it does. One of the you know one of the the failings is they tend to have short finishes or bitter finishes, and right the rum definitely kind of solves that problem. Gotcha. And Brendan, thank you for clarifying. So I I, I may have misspoke. The fifteen point one is the port and rum, and the fifteen point two and fifteen point three are the sherry. So I I may have said sherry on all three. So I'm. But great info there. And then Sugar Kitty says, what a great recommendation as well as a testimony here of the people there and the partnership. They're so not. Oh, it's about Kelvin Cooperage. They're so knowledgeable about the entire process, right from mash to bottling. So they're awesome. We wouldn't we wouldn't be successful at all without Kelvin. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm moving on to the second one. I know you have the third one there. So I'm trying to, like, <laughs> get to that one really quickly. But. Oh, wow. It's, it's very different on the nose compared to the point one. The point one that now again I'm totally new. To, I'm not a fortified wine drink, wine drinker, so I don't know too much. Um, I almost feel like the point two is expressing itself more traditionally. It's a lot more of the brighter fruits, I would say. Yeah, and it should typically a pear sherry and, and oloroso sherry. There is a mm-hmm. sweetness to it and some fruit to it, but it's very nutty. Mm-hmm. So you get a lot of nutty characteristics from from sherry finished bourbons. Yeah, on the nose of this one, it's it's reminding me of a lot of some of my favorite. Finished bourbons in general. So I'm excited to give it a try. Cheers, guys. Wow. What's the proof on that one? I have it here. It's uh, 124.9. Okay. So they're all pretty similar proof. I mean, we were talking about like a, you know, one decimal point yeah. difference between all of these. I bet if we tested them 10 different times, they'd, they'd come out a decimal point different every time. I've so. heard that it's not as accurate as we like to think it is. It, um. It's not. It's <laughs> not. It's by weight. So they do it by weight typically. Um, and did, did I hear that like sometimes a rum cask will like throw the numbers off because the amount of sugar that's from that rum cask? It's possible. I feel like I heard someone else talk about. It. I don't know if it was. It, I don't think it was my own stream. It may have been. I don't know. But someone said like, if you have something that's, that that in, takes on a lot of that sweetness from a rum cask, the sugar levels actually throw off the reading of the um, ABV of it. So it's possible. I, I you'd, you'd have to ask somebody at one of the bottlers or something who's a little, a little more science minded than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so basically, these are all pretty similar proof. Um, we're just experimenting with different finishes, and I gotta say that one to me. I'm just starting like thinking of the difference because they're they're similar in some ways, but they're different in other ways. I think this is more of a sweeter, like a raspberry. I get raspberry more on this one than the first one. The first one was me dark, rich, like you know, like blueberry, like those darker fruits. But this was the brighter fruit forward um, mm-hmm. impact. Um, is that kind of what you, what you get with it as well, or is it am I completely wrong? Yeah, so it's funny with this batch. People ask me all the time, which one do I like the most, and I. Mm-hmm. Every time I taste it, I have a different favorite. Um, okay. So the the notes change depending on what I've had to eat or drink mm-hmm. in that day. Um, I tend to get more sweet, kind of decadent fruits out of the, the out of point one with the tawny port. Mm-hmm. I get nuttiness and lighter red fruits, maybe like black cherry type stuff out of uh, point two. Um, a little bit, not quite as as heavy on the palate. I think is is what I would say. Yeah, you mentioned nuttiness, nuttiness because that's like one of my some of my favorite bourbons are the nutty the nuttier ones and mm-hmm. the more um, oak forward ones. I do agree that this one is more up my alley in terms of what I expect from a bourbon. Now these are all the same mash bill, right? The same blend, mm-hmm. like the same percentage of yeah. each of them. Okay, so we're not like dealing with different distilleries or whatever. We're, these are all kind of the no. same. Okay, right? They they came out of the same tanks when we had finished that rum. They all went into tanks, and then we just divvied it out. Split it that is so interesting how different these are just based on that one aspect of the finish alone. Mm-hmm. I see why you guys released three of them. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, you know, we like to, again, we, we want to be a little different than, than most of the other companies out there. We're not trying to, we're not trying to go head to head with the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection because mm-hmm. they've been doing this for a long time. They, it costs them a lot less to do it. Um, you know, they, they have unlimited supplies. We don't, <laughs> we don't. So when I know you guys, I guess 
are, I mean, not that you portray yourself, but you guys are more of a premium bourbon. What would you say to someone that's not, you know, used to spending, you know, that much? Because these MSRP on these are $199 each. What would yeah. you say that not necessarily convince them, but convinces them to just give it a try? Like, how would you convince them to do that? Well, I would I would say that typically this is not something you're going to sit down and, and uh, you know, you're not going to mix it with anything right. else. Uh, Hopefully, so this, you, this you is do, kind drink, of your special drink how you want to drink, but like however you, you want to do it. But <laughs> this would be your, you know, your special occasion type of bottle. If, if, mm-hmm. if you have to stretch, if we could put this out at 50 bucks, we would. But, right. you know. It, it, the the economies of being a, a, a small scale blender and bottler, it doesn't work. I mean, that's why, you know, half the 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 uh, companies I mentioned earlier, they're all around the same price point. You just can't mm-hmm. do it that cheaply unless you add water. I mean, we could put water mm-hmm. down to 100 proof um, and cut out about 40 bucks, probably a bottle. But um, but, you know, we certainly don't sell it for 199. It's roughly 100 percent markup from the time we sell it to a distributor to the time that you buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, so. As I always say, that everyone makes more money on my whiskey than I do. <laughs> everyone yeah. in the chain, and that's the world. That's the world of bourbon right now. <laughs> it's it's fine. It just is what it is. That's a three tier system for you. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I love. We didn't set out to do it. I, you know, we're very open about pricing. We we didn't set out to do a two hundred dollar bottle. It, it just literally, you know, we can't do it for less than that. Can't do it for less than we sell it. We, we some of them have been 150, some have been 175. It just really depends on on what's in the bottle. But by and large, they come out right around 199, and it's always rounded. Um, you know, if you if you actually do your calculations, we don't sell them for the exact price to the the distributor every time, the exact same price. Mm-hmm. But they'll always round it up to uh, either 175 or 199, something like that. Gotcha. Well, I feel like. Fortgate has just, it's earned its reputation as being a premium whiskey. I don't think I've ever seen anyone say like, oh, they're overpriced. Like I hear that about a lot of other brands, but I've never heard anyone say that about Fortgate. So y'all are obviously doing something very, very right with that. And I've heard a few people say it. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure some typically, people <laughs> typically what I would say is, is that, you know, we, we put out a totally premium product, even the packaging, you know, our bottles are, we have, we have, oh, they're beautiful. Our, we bring the bottles in from Poland. Um, we, you know, they're not, not something you source locally here. It's real cork. Uh, our labels are very expensive. The moment that, that, um, adhesive on the back of them touches the glass is permanent. So you wind up with a lot of mistakes on that. <laughs> um, um, you know, and our whiskey is very expensive and then we use multiple barrels on every one, which is one of the most expensive parts of, mm-hmm. yeah. of, of putting a bourbon out. And it just winds up costing a lot of money, especially when you're only buying 25 barrels at a time from somebody, mm-hmm. <laughs> excuse me, you, you wind up paying a lot more per barrel than someone who's buying a thousand. Yeah. I, I've heard like you said, like the double barreling or even, I mean, just simplifying it even further. I'm mean, not necessarily what you guys have done, but you, you talked a little bit about it, but when brands are putting out like a toasted product where they take a bourbon and they put it into another barrel t- that's toasted, that costs mm-hmm. them a lot of money. The cost of yeah. that is why you're paying more for the toasted <laughs> products than you would expect. And I it think does. it's kind and of it, a similar thing. The more you finish, the more yeah. pricey it is. Well, every time you transfer it from barrel to barrel, you're essentially paying. In, in our case, because we don't have a distiller, we don't have our own bottling line. We use we mm-hmm. use a, a contract bottler. Um, every time you do it, you're basically eating up their their staff for a day. So every time you transfer these, you're paying them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's labor too. I mean, it's it's expensive. And what I would typically say is that if you can't afford a two hundred dollar bourbon, I certainly understand it. I, I don't have anything anything against it uh, against you. And I, I don't, you know. You know, everyone, everyone has different, uh, different value propositions with drinking. Some people just refuse to drink anything over $40 mm-hmm. and that's fine. We're probably not for you. Um, yeah. And I was, I was there, you know, I remember it literally like a year and a half ago, like, I, the most expensive I'd ever paid for a bourbon was like 60. I'm like, I'll mm-hmm. never buy another bourbon. I'll never buy bourbon over $60. And wow. Just in a year and a half, my opinion has completely changed. I've spent a lot more than that. Um, actually, so for people that are here on my channel, I actually just uploaded a review of Barrel's new gold label, which is a five hundred dollar bourbon. Ooh. Um, so if you missed that review, go check it out on my channel after the stream. Uh, I'll let you know what I thought of that one. Um, it, it's very good, but it's also like not that's outside of my price range. <laughs> but I think I think price is relative to you know just how expertly these are crafted, not just the bourbon itself, but the blending. I mean, you are the chief blending officer at Fourgate. Um, do, what is your favorite part about blending? Um, really, I think it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I just like that you're kind of creating something new out of something that, that already exists. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a challenge every time you sit down to blend, even if you're just, 
even if we're just putting out a straight rye that's not even barrel finished, um, mm -hmm. the first time around I wanted to blend it away from the minty flavor you tend to get out of the Indiana rye. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we did a pretty good job with that. And the second time I wanted it towards a spicier characteristic and it had a lot of that mint in it, mm -hmm. uh, but it was kind of fun. It, it's fun. And it's also a chore because you sit down with 50 barrel samples and you need to pick 13 for a batch and you have to taste them each over three days. It gets to be a, it gets to be a lot. <laughs> oh, um, I so. imagine I, I've, I've never even done a pick, but I've heard that they're, they're very fun, but they're also very draining because you were trying they a lot be, yeah. and it's hard to keep up with. <laughs> they can be. Yeah, so I just I just poured the 15.3, which is the one that you happen to have. This is a, of course, the same bourbon whiskey finished in Tawny Port. Ah, man, I, I keep trying to remember a para. A para. I keep wanting to say Aperol because I think I'm, th I'm thinking Aperol spritz. So I'm, yeah. My brain's yeah. thrown off. Uh, a para <laughs> sherry and dark rum. So this has been finished in all three casks. Uh, there you go. There's the bottle right there. So the proof on this one is 124.7. Um, which is the is it the highest? Nope, nope, a little bit under the last one, but they're all within a couple like point one yeah. proof points apart. Um, so this one is kind of the culmination of all the, the two combined. So yes, what what made you decide to? Because you said they're very different. We we mentioned that the, the port mm -hmm. and the sherry are very different. What made you be like? Let's just put them together. <laughs> well, we were already working under that trilogy name because we had the three um, the three different distillates in it. Mm -hmm. And we just figured that let's go ahead and do it a trilogy again and release three bottles at once and um, three different finishes. And we tried, you know, before we made that call, we tried it to make sure that that mixing them together does work. Mm -hmm. And we actually came up with some, you know, it, it wasn't we just took half and dumped it. We we took a portion and, and decided what what ratio we like better. Is there more port? Is there more sherry? How much more? Gotcha. Um, question from our Aussie. I don't, I don't know if you can answer or not, but Lil says, which Australian sherry is it? Which company? I don't know if you can tell us, but <laughs> I, <laughs> any hints for our Aussie friends? I, I don't know. I don't believe the barrels had the name on it, okay. um, but we probably have an NDA anyway. No okay. disclosure agreement. Well, just Lil, Lil is really passionate about like um, Australian wine as well. Because I mean, I've had on the channel, I've had, um, ah, man, is it Star, Starward that does, that does um, Australian wine casks? um and then lil lil's a huge fan of them as well mm -hmm. so she she loves like nerding out about australian wine so oh that's fun australian um, australia produces some great stuff yeah i haven't actually tried australian wine I, i've heard it's great according to lil because she's literally the one that sells me on all the time <laughs> oh man on the nose it, i mean i hate to say best of both worlds that seems like like but like for real like it has the desserty like cakey kind of qualities like the pie because for me the first one the point one gave me a bunch of pie characteristics like a rich baked good the second mm -hmm. one was like fresh fruit this is like fresh fruit on top of a pie if that makes sense <laughs> i'm really liking the nose yeah. on this one i haven't tried it yet but i'm going to dive in cheers cheers Wow. I don't even have to think about it. That one's my favorite. <laughs> Man, it, it has the finish, that nutty kind of finish that the second one was giving me. But it's just so well-rounded with like the baked pie crust kind of note that I was getting from the first one. I know you said people ask you which one's your favorite all the time. I, I'm not going to ask you that. But but which one's your favorite? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, but so... I don't want to say which one's your favorite. What flavors do you normally gravitate towards? Just because I'm curious to know, like, what your palate is. I mean, you are one of the, you know, how many people are involved with 4 Is it three of y'all? Just two. Two, okay. Yeah. So people, I mean, I think people are curious to see, like, what's your palate? What do you gravitate towards um, when you're looking for, not necessarily just I like, releases, but. I like high-rise spicy bourbons. High-rise spicy bourbon. Hey, I'm right there on board with you. Yeah. I, I'm typically not a weeded bourbon fan. Um, mm -hmm. I occasionally will get a hankering for some, but uh, more or less I, I, I stick to the spicy stuff. Yeah. And I like, I like a high rye bourbon over a rye whiskey any day of the week. Oh, really? I think, see, I'm like half and half because like I, st I started in bourbon entirely mm -hmm. and I've just tried, I'm a big fan of Indiana rye. I honestly like some of, some of the, I like the spicy mintiness and I know um, some people here in the chat that I talk to regularly, that's not their thing, but for me, it's always been my thing. So I feel like I'm kind of half and half right now. So, <laughs> I I love the Indiana. I, I love their bourbon and their rice out of mm -hmm. Indiana. Um, they when they're done well, I always get. Um, I don't know if everyone else ever got these, but they were. It'd be in my Easter basket or something, and they were these little. They looked like orange slices, but they were 
kind of gummy and covered in sugar. Oh yeah, and I it's, know it's the about. citrusy. Yeah. <laughs> that's the note mm -hmm. that I get on on a really good Indiana rye or bourbon when it's mm -hmm. really hitting on all cylinders. Is this candied citrus flavor that I just Ooh. love in those whiskeys. And it one thing about it, we haven't used a lot of of the Indiana stuff. Um, other than the rye, we actually our batch seventeen mm -hmm. is the first time we've used a little bit of the Indiana bourbon, but mm -hmm. it finishes really well on, with barrel finish. It just matches up perfectly with pretty much anything you throw at it, mm -hmm. and that's not know, the case with Tennessee mm -hmm. bourbons that are so peanutty and kind of peanut brittle. <laughs> they don't really take the from for me. They don't really take the finishes well at all. Yeah, no, I I, I haven't had too much finished um, Indiana bourbon, but I've had a lot of finished Indiana rye. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see more of. Um, sorry, as loud noises cars outside my window <laughs> apologize um it's funny trisha trisha over at whiskey ice she said same she prefers high rye and then she's like no wait i like rye more <laughs> so trisha sounds like we're on the same page with that but yeah i mean i think i love that like the opinion has completely changed just in like a year of a, people's opinion on indiana whiskey in general i think there's been a whole 180 twist on people really appreciating the stuff that's coming out of you know mgp we'll say it we're not afraid to say it um but i think I love that people are able to source not just their middle of the road stuff, but their higher age. I mean, you said you have like what seven to nine year old Indiana rye in your other releases. Mm -hmm. That's super well aged. I mean, compared to some of the yep. stuff I've tried, that's that's awesome. I mean, we've released uh, the the one that you have is a seven year old mm -hmm. rye before we finish it. That uh, Ruby Rye Springs. Yeah. Um, I think Rye Down Under was eight years old. That just came out batch sixteen. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about the. The more recent releases. So this is batch 15, but you guys have had 16 and 17 since mm -hmm. then. I know some people here in the chat have been drinking it tonight. So for me, that, that's not super familiar with them. Can you tell us a little bit about what those batches were? Yeah, 16 is right down under, and it's a uh, seven or seven or eight-year-old Indiana rye um, aged in the Apera Sherry cask. So the same type of cask that these are. They were different casks, but the mm -hmm. same type that, uh, that these were finished in. And then 17 is our third release of Split Stave. And this one... Um, we uh, we got a little creative with it. So we, we did a blend of bourbon and rye. Um, we had uh, two Kentucky bourbons, an Indiana bourbon, and an Indiana rye. Blended them together. It was super spicy, which I love, which is this is why this is my favorite batch. Mm -hmm. Our split stave barrels are, uh, Calvin makes them ex exclusively for us, and they'll make a series of toasted barrels, series of charred barrels. And before we use them, they take them all apart. Yeah. And they put them back together and alternate the staves between toasted and charred. So it looks like a zebra inside the barrel. Yeah, so for those of you that whiskey. haven't seen that, I, I've done a review of one of them. If you look at the thumbnail for that, it, you can see the cask. It's literally mm -hmm. alternating. It's like the toasted yeah. one and like the, the charred one. It, it looks really cool. I love the way it looks. <laughs> well, this time we used French oak instead okay. of American oak form. So it's spice on top of spice, and it is – I love it. It's oh, the perfect awesome. Christmas whiskey for me. Oof, yes. Mm. So – we talked a little bit about, you know, this batch and the next batch, but coming in 2022, we're at the end of the year. What do you guys, not necessarily what do you guys have, not asking for the secrets, but do you guys have anything that, that you personally are like really excited about, you know, not, you know, giving all the details, but is there anything, is there something that you're really excited about coming next year? Well, we'll be doing a Kelvin collaboration four, um, which is kind of our signature line, I guess. Um, and we're going to be doing our, our uh, single barrel program, the phase two, the second round of them will come out early next year. Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited. We, we have a lot of expansion plans. So we're just, just trying to make sure that we can really what we're focused on is making sure that we can expand our production enough to support it because Texas is huge. It, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a, it's a big chunk to, to mm -hmm. take in at once. Um, but we just need to make sure that if we do expand that we're not sacrificing anything in terms of quality. So really working on, on maintaining the type of stuff that, that, that we're doing now um, and just making sure that we can, we can stay ahead of the game when it comes to expansion. Absolutely. Um, if anyone in the chat has any last minute questions before we uh, let Bill <coughs> get on with his night, um, please leave them in the chat. I, I'd love to hear. Cause I know a lot of you guys have had more experience with some other four gate products that I have not tried myself. Like I said, I, I've only had, I had a split stave rye, which is, it was an earlier batch. I mean, do I want to say batch seven? That might have been too early. It may not ten. have been batch seven. That would have been ten, yeah. Ten. Okay, okay. I had that one, and then I had the Ruby Rice Springs, which fell in love with. Um, but other than that, th this is only my second time, or I guess third time, trying Forgate. And you guys are just killing it. You guys are doing such a fantastic jo job with the blending and the finishing. Because it's hard to pick a favorite of these three. They're, they all have something unique going for them. 
So for me, I'm gravitating towards the third one is my favorite, but that's because it's like <laughs> a blend of all of it. So, I mean, well, I appreciate it. We exceptional we're, job there. We're having a lot of fun with it, and we've we've uh, we've been fortunate um, that Bobby is Bobby is fantastic at what he does, and he's really the guy out there beating the streets and finding whiskey, uh, which is in, getting harder and harder to do every day. Um, so he's he's just done an outstanding job um, sourcing that whiskey for us, so that we can we can do what we do. And it's been it's just been a blast. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a dream come true when it's something that you really, really enjoy in the first place, and then suddenly you can do it, um, you know, professionally. It's it's neat. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Are you, are you guys are based in Kentucky, right? Right. Look, we're both in Louisville. Yeah. Okay. Our operations are in Bardstown, but but we are gotcha. we're in Louisville. Gotcha. Um, do you guys like? Are you guys like open about like what what company you partner with locally with like the bottling and stuff? Is it you know, or is it just kind of an independent situation um yeah we we have we've been working with a company from the start uh that, that's done a good job for us um okay and, and um it, it's it's all independently done though okay yeah i was just because i've yeah. talked to a lot of brands that have either partnered with like castle and key and barts bourbon company so i was just curious but yeah um but very cool well um whiskey ice says the next time we come across a four gate we are buying it um, we haven't seen it in Alabama. So you said you guys are in six states right now. Yeah. Um, but you're trying to add two states a year. So is Roughly, Alabama in yeah. the in the sites for next year? <laughs> well, we have we we work with other than Tennessee because because our distributor doesn't uh, operate in Tennessee. We work with Republic National Distributing Company, and they've been outstanding partners. They're just fantastic folks, uh, men and women who work there, um, and they they are kind of telling us what states they need us in. So they mm -hmm. kind of drive the expand where we go. We we tell them a couple of times they've come to us and said we need you to expand. <laughs> we, we need you in this state because we need a we need a, a premium bourbon to fill this mm -hmm. um, you know market segment or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but other times we've gone to them and said we're ready for for a new state and they tell us which one to go to. And yeah. it just works. It's a good partnership. Brandon says, Oregon needs to come to California. Like I said, my friend Fred was in Texas, which you said is one of your states you guys do. And he just, he sent me a photo and like, they had a whole lineup of four gate. I'm like, I was just like starstruck. I'm like, I need all of that, but I can't afford all of that. So I'll buy one. Um, and it, it, I, I'm so thankful. So hopefully, yeah, Brandon wants to see you in California. I'm in California. So I definitely want to see more of four gates. So very cool. I'm, I'm so excited for what you guys are doing. I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's odd, not odd. It's rare that a company that's so new into like the blending world is so well received. And I've just heard nothing but good things about Four Gates. So you guys are just doing an absolutely fantastic job. And I look forward to more of what's to come from you guys. Well, great. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. So before we go, um, is there anywhere where can people find you you personally and Four Gate on the web? Do you have like an Instagram or anything you want to shout out? Yeah, we're on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. There's a uh four gate community group on Facebook where we, we release a lot of news directly to, to fans, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and consumers. Um, and I think it's called four gate whiskey company community or something like that. Um, uh, so you can, you can get in touch with us there. Um, um, you can email me bill at four Um, and we're at four whiskey.com for our website as well. Awesome. Well, Bill, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been amazing. I'm so excited to try everything from Four Gate, um, including this trilogy release. If anyone's wondering, yes, I recommend all of them. They're fantastic, and it's just delicious bourbon. Um, that's all I can say. Like thumbs up for that one. But um, Bill, you're welcome back anytime when you guys have new releases. Um, I'm excited to see what's to come next year. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. We'll we'll make sure we we keep you on our list. I appreciate that. Well, cheers, everyone. Thank y'all for watching. Patrons, head over to Discord for our after party. We're about to get started here very soon. Um, but yeah, thank y'all for watching. And I will see you on my new podcast episode that comes out tomorrow morning. Um, and then I will be doing a... Um, I, I'm not going to... It's the holidays. I'll, I'll let y'all know my schedule <laughs> soon because I'm about to go traveling. Um, but thank y'all for watching. And cheers. And I'll see you when I see you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks. again, Bill. <laughs> Thank you.